As the title suggests, we have two unique seasonal impacts expected for the United States. Over the northwest, we have our first major fall-like system, bringing lots of higher terrain snowfall and elevated winds for much of the upper and central Rockies. Down over the southeast, we have that broad area of low pressure expected to take shape off the Carolina and Florida coastlines that could help inundate us with plentiful rainfall and thunderstorm activity. Hurricane Nigel is expected to take on the form of yet another major hurricane in the Atlantic, and we're closely waiting for Ophelia's tropical wave to come off of Africa and begin to take shape as well. Today on Weather Center, we'll cover all of these individual entities and discuss exactly what that could mean for those of you living in areas affected by them. viewers, welcome back to Weather Center Nazaria. We're starting here on National Hurricane Center's homepage, and we do have a few tropical features to talk about today. Hurricane Nigel is still a Category 1 with winds of 80 miles per hour in his center, and we haven't seen too much in the way of fluctuation with his central pressure still hanging out at 984 millibars, which is just about a mirror image of what we saw at the 5 a.m. advisory, and I do anticipate we'll start to slowly see more of a deepening trend as we go through the next 6 to 12 hours. He's still headed off to the northwest at 12 miles per hour at a steady rate, should dodge Bermuda Bermuda well off to a few hundred miles to their east, thankfully, so it looks like Bermuda will only see something in the way of some enhanced surfing conditions along the coastlines. Disturbance number one is up to a 70% chance of formation in the next seven days. The tropical wave has yet to come off of Africa, but a lot of our deterministic and ensemble model products indicate that the likelihood of seeing development over the next five to seven days is pretty much through the roof, albeit the GFS is a little wishy-washy and back and forth on whether or not we'll actually see Ophelia take shape, but the likes of the Icon, Euro, Canadian model, even the UK and Korean models are on board that Ophelia will be joining us over the next couple of days. Finally, we have disturbance number two. I'll say disturbance because this is actually a non-tropical entity forming up off the southeastern coastline. National Hurricane Center does have this identified as a typical disturbance. However, I can assure you that we don't see too much in the way of tropical characteristics with it, especially during its cyclogenesis or its initial development for that matter. National Hurricane Center states a non-tropical area of low pressure is forecast to form near the southeastern coast of the U.S. It could acquire some subtropical characteristics if it hangs out over open water for long enough. We could start to see more tropical-like thunderstorm activity closest to its vortex, which would give it that subtropical, tropical kind of formation. Basically, what the difference is, is tropical would be all warm core, all thunderstorm convective activity, whereas subtropical would be a kind of a mixture of the two put together, both baroclinic jet-supported and what we'd see in a typical tropical cyclone. Here's the latest information on Hurricane Nigel. As of 11 a.m., we're still expecting him to track off to the northwest before boomeranging out into the central and northern Atlantic, posing no substantial harm to anybody, thankfully. This is a definitive fish storm, not crossing that 60-degree west longitude line. National Hurricane Center still predicts he could become a major hurricane over the next day or two, as he continues to intensify while he's still underneath and within favorable conditions to do so. Some of the latest intensity guidance has shown a bit of a backing-off trend on this kind of predicament. I don't anticipate we're really going to undergo that much in terms of significant rapid cycle Genesis, as we all like to mention, especially with what we saw with the likes of Hurricane Lee and even Margot to an extent who deepened pretty quickly in a 24-hour span before finally becoming nothing but a remnant low. Here's the latest 12Z intensity guidance, as a matter of fact, and you can see that the general trend is to keep it as a Cat 1, maybe pushing into Category 2 threshold with less agreement for major hurricane status. So we could possibly see National Hurricane Center bring down their intensity forecast a little bit, unless we see some big changes over the next 6 to 12 hours with each upcoming model run. The Halfs A and B hurricane models still do depict a Category 3, maybe even a Category 4 storm coming out of Nigel. Given the situation that this system has been through over the last 24 to 48 hours and the trends that we've seen in his overall progression from a disturbance to a depression and then eventually a storm now a hurricane, he's been a bit more steady in terms of his strengthening. We haven't seen anything really bomb out like we saw with earlier systems this year, so I do anticipate we'll see him strengthen into a Category 2 while he still has a favorite time frame to do so, but I don't think we're really going to see him blow up into a major hurricane. We could see him catch Category 3 intensity as we go over line. You did see some of the intensity guidance does hint at we see a major hurricane out of him, but I don't think we'll get anywhere near Category 4. You can see the HAFS A model does want to deepen this down into a major hurricane with the minimum central pressure reaching as low as 955 millibars before being caught by this frontal system high pressure ridge beginning to work its way off the mid-Atlantic and northeast coastlines. I find it very interesting that 
the Hafs models actually do a great job of outlining its leading edge. You can see in the change in wind speeds, you can see that troughing in the winds going from westerly to southerly all of a sudden, and that increased wind swath, if you will, all this blue shading coming off the United States coast as it works its way further and further into the Atlantic. Once it interacts with the center of circulation of Hurricane Nigel, you can see, boom, immediately begins to boomerang back out into open water, posing no threat to any major landmass. The Hafs B model is a bit more conservative with its development, and you can see it reminiscent of a Category 2 hurricane at its deepest central pressure, 967 millibars. The Hafs B also depicts that same frontal system cold air advection coming off the coast and ricocheting this system out into open water, the North Atlantic, to become nothing more than a post-tropical remnant system. All right, I'll be openly honest. I've been waiting to talk all about this southeast coastline system that has been trying to trend across a lot of the social media platforms and mass media, for that matter, as of recently. So we're looking at the Euro model, and as you can see, going through time, we get an organized area of precipitation off the Florida coastline that eventually deepens down into an organized low. Minimum central pressure only between 1,000 to 1,010 millibars with really no center of circulation definitive of a tropical cyclone, but a lot of folks are still pointing out that this could be our next named system. I'm here to tell you truthfully, I do not foresee this happening whatsoever. We have all the dynamics of a textbook jet-supported low taking shape off the coast. The reason we're seeing it develop so far to the south, whereas its traditional source region would actually be off the North Carolina coast is because of the significant troughing that Lee actually induced with the long wave pattern across the southeast to where the jet is now running across the Gulf of Mexico interior parts of Florida. So that's the main reason we're actually seeing the source region transition from up here, what we would call by regime characteristics, a Hatteras low down off to become what is looking like a Space Coast low, if you will. Here are the 200 millibar winds so you can get a sense of where the jet is. You can see that long wave trough axis digging down across the Gulf of Mexico in the state of Florida, where eventually we see a bit more increased deepening thanks to the introduction of a jet max working its way in over our mid amplitude ridge over the southwestern parts of Mexico. This is going to help to deepen our trough further and alongside some shortwave activity, there you can see we have a 1008 millibar low pressure situated just off the Florida coast. So you can see that most of the dynamics in play in terms of developing the system actually come from above, whereas with tropical characteristics, we have everything starting from the surface and working their way up. What we're looking at here is the 500 millibar geopotential and vorticity chart. We're very familiar with this. I've used this countless times on Weather Center Nazario. If you look at this area of intense yellow to red shading right across Oklahoma, Kansas, and parts of the Texarkana region as well, working its way off to the east-southeast, this is the shortwave trough that's going to help to induce cyclogenesis off the Florida coast. As you continue through time, you could see it riding the jet energy we saw at 200 millibars directly into parts of Mississippi, Alabama, and eventually Florida. At that point, you start to see a very broad circulation begin to form up in the upper levels of the atmosphere. So unlike what we would see with tropical systems, we're actually seeing it take shape above and translate down to the surface. And at the surface, what we're all highlighting as a potential tropical cyclone is actually the upper level reflection down to ground level of this low beginning to develop. That same shortwave trough over the central and southern plains is also going to help to induce some pretty wild weather for folks in Kansas, Oklahoma, and northern Texas. We'll get into that here momentarily. We're going to stop on in for our ensembles as well, just so we can take a good look at exactly what is happening with that disturbance that could take shape into Ophelia, because I do believe that southeast circulation that does develop in the next few days is actually going to help to deter Ophelia from moving any further westward than she probably should. As you go through time, you can see off the African coast, we have a number of ensemble members depicted depicting development of our disturbance once it finally gets out over open water. On the 24th of September, that's when we could anticipate we could see tropical storm Ophelia begin to take shape, and then a lot of the ensembles very quickly, just like we're seeing with Hurricane Nigel currently, eject her off into the central and eventually the North Atlantic, posing no harm to anyone in its path. If you go back in time, you can see off the southeast coast, we also have some good ensemble agreement that that low pressure system developed by the jet aloft and that short wave discussed at 500 millibars begins to move off to the north and eventually the north-northeast, taking with it that jet energy at 200 millibars that's going to help to move a trough off the coast, erode that mid-Atlantic high that's steering her west initially, and eventually allow her to lift to the north because we're going to go back to a more zonal pattern across eastern Conus and the western Atlantic Ocean. If you track it through time and watch both systems as that low along the mid-Atlantic coast begins to finally move its way off to the east, off the northeastern coastline, you can notice a lot of the member agreement with Ophelia begins to also move north as well because the low that 
that organized off the southeast coast is diminishing that mid to sharp amplitude ridge that would have forced her further west towards the Caribbean, towards the Bahamas, which is one of the trends we noticed a couple days ago with Ophelia's initial ensemble members trying to show organization a week to 10 days out. The GFS also does a great job with this. You can see that as we start to see ensemble members pinging on that southeast circulation, Ophelia is finally showing up in the main development region. And as both of them begin to line up in sync with their timing, we get that eastern low to move out into open water, and Ophelia really begins to deepen down into a named storm as they kind of intersect, or their areas of influence intersect, I should say, both aloft and down closer to the surface. You can see that that trough helping to induce our low off of Florida begins to pick up Ophelia as well, like we saw with Lee, and move her safely into open water, dodging any major landmass, let alone Bermuda for that matter as well. One area we're still watching for that the models have been very finicky with is any kind of development out over the Western Caribbean. If you all remember, I know it seems like so far in the past since we spent so much time talking about Lee and Margo and now we're moving into Nigel and eventually Ophelia kind of territory, Hurricane Adalia took shape over the Western Caribbean all in part thanks to our Central American gyre. Some of the latest GFS and Canadian ensembles do indicate that we could see this gyre start to act up and try to reignite some activity over the Western Caribbean and eventually move north, as you can see indicated by some of the GFS ensemble members kind of being a little all over the place over Western Cuba, parts of the Yucatan, and eventually, dare I say it, the Florida Peninsula. This has been very off and on, guys. I'm not trying to raise any concern for this area, and in fact, I'm starting to lose confidence that we may see something out of this source region, simply because because a lot of our deterministic models from the Euro, GFS, Canadian, Icon, UK, etc., you name it, really haven't pinpointed anything in terms of a circulation deepening down and moving into the Gulf, let alone even instigating any kind of rapid intensification of a system moving in past the Lesser Antilles to eventually make that hook into the Gulf. We've seen no indications in the few times that the GFS has tried to induce something. It's been way out into the run, 300 hours plus. It continued to push it further and further into the future, and now it's completely washed any sort of a circulation off altogether, so none of our models are indicating development outside of a few ensemble members trying to agree that there is a very small marginal chance of development out there. So still worth investigating, still something I'm going to watch out for, just like the rest of us in the weather community, just to kind of stay ahead of it, especially as we rotate into the month of October. I've mentioned a few different times already that CPC has highlighted a 20 plus percent chance that we could see development down the road, so not taking my eyes off of it, still just letting you guys know that it's it's a very low threat chance at this time. We're going to shift gears now and talk interior cone as severe weather because there is an area that I want to mention over the central plains, especially affecting parts of Kansas and Oklahoma and eventually Arkansas and parts of Texas as well as it continues to unfold and kind of expand in a north to south fashion. We're on to the NAM, 32 kilometer NAM. This is 200 millibars. We're taking a look at the jet level again. And I love how the NAM does such a good job of indicating a good region of difluent flow pretty much right over top where we're expecting our significant weather to pan out. As you look where I've drawn my circle, you can see the spreading of the streamlines at the 200 millibar level. And what this does is indicate good vertical exhaust for whatever may be forming closer to ground level. So what that difluence aloft is going to do is help accelerate vertical motion with our thunder storms when they begin to take shape sometime between Tuesday and maybe even to parts of Wednesday as well depending on when our short wave at 500 millibars can get there. You can see the same thing at 500 millibars. Just before we encountered that split flow with the jet stream across the southern tier states, part of that jet energy trickling down into the southeast to help develop our low off the Florida coast, that same short wave energy at 500 is going to help to really ignite our thunderstorm activity that even Storm Prediction Center is highlighting. If you look at between 18 to 0 Z on Tuesday into Wednesday, look at all that red-yellow shading across Oklahoma and Kansas. That is your major short wave trough, folks, and that's what's going to help to further intensify what thunderstorm activity that it does start to take shape near ground level and accelerate it as it ascends the atmosphere, really developing some of those substantial storms SPC has been highlighting for the last couple of days. I also want to point out our first major baroclinic unstable wave moving across the pack northwest parts of British Columbia, Alberta into the central Rockies. Right here, we're looking at the GFS total snowfall accumulation, and you can see a lot.
lot of good higher terrain snowfall effect going on across most of the northern and central Rockies, and it continues to do so as you go further and further with time. You can see transition seasons really starting to take effect across western Conus. It's just a matter of time of when it'll finally trickle into eastern Conus. We've moved over to College of DuPage because I wanted to show you guys one chart that I used to use a lot during my western Conus forecasting. This here is our 700 millibar vertical velocities, and I wanted to kind of point out a textbook feature we typically see during our transitional season between summer to fall and an iconic feature or weather phenomena I should say that takes place across much of fall and throughout the duration of winter time and it's pretty significant for folks along the front range of the Rockies. If you look right in through this general channel here those darker shades kind of envelope between greens, yellows, and reds, that actually indicates very high intensity downward vertical motion because what's happening is called cross barrier flow. When you have winds at 700 millibars and up running perpendicular to higher terrain features such as the Rocky Mountains, what ends up happening is you get some winds along the lee of the Rockies in way of downsloping winds. And these winds warm with their descent towards the ground and what they do is essentially create a large swath a very, very high paced wind. Sometimes we've seen 50, 60 knots out of a downsloping event. And they can be very treacherous for folks along the Lee of the Rockies because they can happen real fast. Almost in the form of what you'd see in terms of tornadic development. They can take shape within the span of minutes. And if we didn't have watches or warnings out for this kind of criteria, we could bust in the blink of an eye. That's how fast this phenomena could take shape. So you can see that we have the jet really digging in south over the northwest quadrant of the U.S., which again is very indicative that we're finally starting to see summer transition more into fall. It's kind of a dueling of two different seasons right now over western and eastern Conus. Out east, we're still seeing a semblance of summertime with that tropical subtropical feature trying to form up off the east coastline with remnants of that frontal system also helping to ignite further thunderstorm activity. And out west, we're finally starting to see our more major snow activity along the higher terrain, good cross barrier flow, which will likely induce some downsloping across parts of Montana, Wyoming, and the front range of Colorado. So we're definitely transitioning from west to east as we go through time. We'll wrap up with Weather Prediction Center's surface analysis. As you go through time into the middle to late parts of Wednesday, you can see a very weak, stable wave sparking off that severe weather for Oklahoma, parts of Kansas, and Texas, and our first major unstable wave moving across the Rockies into the Great Plains. You can see it indicated by these two low-level vortices, low-pressure vortices, across parts of South Dakota, Wyoming, Idaho, kind of the northern Four Corners region, which is going to help to induce that higher terrain snowfall I showed you with the GFS. If you look down into the southeastern United States, you can also see that broad area of low pressure with fronts connected to it, which will completely dispel any kind of tropical characteristics, at least according to Weather Prediction Center. If it does manage to hang out over open water long enough, we'll start to see some more thunderstorm activity form up near its vortex, which could give it a bit of a tropical, more of a subtropical determination in terms of its overall appearance, but that's if it decides to hang out long enough before ejecting north with the rest of that jet energy we saw at two, 300 millibars. Just some very interesting phenomena going on out there. That low off the east coast is definitely going to help influence what Ophelia does down the road. We'll have to see how that shakes out to then determine exactly what Ophelia is going to do when she finally gets her act together in open water of the Atlantic. But with that being said, guys, we're going to walk our way into the outro. This brings us to yet another concluding segment of Weather Center Nazario. As you can see across the United States and much of the Atlantic for that matter, there is no single system worth really honing in on or focusing at this time, which is actually a good thing. Hurricane Nigel will continue to intensify over the next two to three days before finally hooking out to sea, posing no threat to any major landmass to include Bermuda, and I'm very thankful for that. And from the looks of it, our future disturbance, once it finally works its way off of Africa, is anticipated to develop into Ophelia, our O-named system, but hopefully should pose no significant threat to anybody as well, thanks to the southeastern system beginning to develop off the coastline, and should pose no significant threat to anyone as well, as we see cyclogenesis take place off the southeast coast, and that low in of itself can help generate another area of high pressure to kick her out to sea as well. As transition season begins for the United States, we're going to see quite Quite an interesting mix of phenomena. Summer is going to try to cling hold as best as it can, even as we begin to rotate into the actual fall season, and we're going to start seeing an uptick in winter-like weather as our systems roll in the packed northwest coast and portions of British Columbia. Thank you all for tuning in today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Monday, and this entire week, for that matter, is very positive for each and every one of you watching, and for those of you who aren't. I'm still wishing you all well across the board. We'll see you back tomorrow for our next episode of Weather Center Nazario, as well as tonight at 8 
p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our good old Tropics Talk, guys. Until then, this is Weather Center Nazario, signing out.